Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We're actually starting a new series of lessons. This lessons these lessons will be uh, spread over a period of three months from January through March of 2014. And this is the lesson that we'll be studying for January 4. We hope you all had a wonderful new year. And uh, let's jump into our lesson, the first lesson entitled Disciples in Scripture. If you're interested in possibly getting the materials that we use in our handouts here, uh, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And so, to begin our study, we hope you've got your Bible in hand. Let's pray together. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have so many things for which to be thankful for, and now as we talk about what it could mean to be your disciples in the 21st century, may we understand it, but most of all, Lord, may we learn how to put it into practice in our own lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. About 200 years or so before Christ was born, and uh, there's some dispute about that timing, so don't try to hold me to that a system of synagogue schools was instituted in Israel. Young boys were expected to attend those synagogue schools at least to the age of 10. Uh, girls were never included, as you might have guessed, in those ancient times. Much of the time was spent in memorizing the five books of Moses, the Torah, as they would call it. After that point, many of the students were sent home to learn a trade from their families, from their parents. A few select students were asked to continue and allowed to go to the next level in which they were expected to memorize the rest of the Old Testament. Um, and they did, so, did that between the ages of 10 to 15. Finally, at that point, most of the rest of the students were sent home, and just a few of the very best students were kept to learn the favorite sayings of the fathers and those students eventually graduated to become the new rabbis. And one succeeded, he was really considered to be the most honored person among the most honored people in the nation. Um, if you get the handout or you see up there, uh, you, can, you can find that under a, a rab website called followtherabbi.com. You look around there a little bit. But unfortunately, despite memorizing all that material, the rabbis misread and misinterpreted much of the scripture and missed a correct understanding of the main character, of course, who was Jesus Christ. In our study of discipleship, we need to understand clearly that the God of the Old Testament was, Old Testament was none other than Jesus. Jesus Christ, Jesus himself. Now you're going to ask me, how did I know that? And so we go to our first text. Start with John 5, 39, where it says, and here there's a difference of opinion about how this should be translated. Some versions have, and this is probably more correct, you study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me. And of course, at the time when Jesus was speaking, what scriptures was he talking about? The Old Testament. What we would call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture. Um, there was no New Testament at that point in time. Okay? And to add to that, look at Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me, this is Jesus talking, in the Law of Moses, what would that be? The Law of Moses. Five books of Moses. The five books of Moses, the Torah, the writings of the prophets. Now their, their list of prophets would, is a little different than ours would be. They would include Judges and, and, and Joshua and among the prophets. But anyway, it, the Hebrew Bible has a list of prophets. And then the Psalms. And why is it called Psalms, do you know? In third section of the Old Testament in Hebrew Bibles? It's called by different names. Sometimes it's called the Hagiographa the Holy Writings, it's the third section, and it's called Psalms because that was the first book in that final section of the Old Testament. So there was the Law, the Prophets, 
and the Psalms. So Jesus said, everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms had to come true. So how much of the Old Testament is included? All of it. All of it. And one more passage that's maybe even a little more direct is found in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. I want you to remember, it says in my Good News Bible, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses? They were all under the protection of the cloud, all passed safely through the Red Sea. Is it pretty clear about what time he's talking about? In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. So Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament were apparently were very clear that eventually, I should say, eventually they became very clear that the God of the Old Testament was Jesus. How is it that the rabbis and actually almost all of the people at the time of Jesus were so wrong about what the old, all of the Old Testament said about Jesus. Why did they expect something else? And is it possible that we are misinterpreting scripture now and have a wrong idea of Jesus coming? Very good question and let me give you a brief and definitely not comprehensive answer to that. Jesus tried to tell them that he was the God of the Old Testament. And part of the reason why, remember what they wanted, what they wanted was to get on, out from underneath the yoke of the Romans. They were hoping that the Messiah was going to come and l at least get them out from under the Romans, if not make them conquerors of the world. That's what they wanted. That was their fierce hope. So what they did is they took from the Old Testament Passages which Christians now take from the Old Testament, predicting the second coming and the third coming. And they wanted to apply those passages to his first coming. And that's what happened. The only coming that they understood. The only coming that they knew about. about. Yeah. So. It's a good thing we're not wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look at Luke 4. Um, there's two many sections not too far apart in Luke 4 that give us some very interesting information. Uh, the first one is about the temptations. What were the three temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness there after starving himself for 40 days when the devil approached him? What, what were the three temptations? Prove that you're God. Okay, prove that you're God by doing what? The first one was turn a stone into bread. Turn a stone into bread. What was the second one? Now this depends, the second and third ones are switched over, switched by Matthew and Luke. They have a difference of opinion, but it's the same temptation. It's just a question of which one came first, we don't know. But so, one of the second ones, or one of the other two temptations were what? Jump off the temple. Jump off the temple, okay, and why would you do that? I think that was what was in the... Um in the layman's, well, the Jews thought that was how the Messiah was going to present himself. And it's, it's found, I believe it's in Psalm 78, that kind of an idea. And so that was, you see, this is a way to prove that you're the Messiah. Jump off here and if you, 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 you land safely on, what, 40 feet below or something like that on the, on the stones without hurting yourself, that's proof they'll accept you. The people will accept you. What more could you ask for? And the other temptation? Bow down to... Yeah. I'll give you everything if you bow down and Satan. worship. Yeah, why, why do you need to go through all this trouble? You know, all the way up through including the cross and sacrificing your life, etc. I'll give it to you. Just bow down. That's all you got to do. You can have it all. And... <laughs> what happened? To each of those temptations, Jesus answered, It is written, ta ta ta. Yeah. It is written. What do you think that has to do with our quarter this, this time? Yeah, what's that got to do with discipleship? And what does that, and that was my next question, what does that have to do with discipleship? Well, well we, we need to know the scripture. Yeah, well, but, but, but think about this for a moment. If, if Jesus were here to be his mentee or a disciple, what would we do? 
study the scriptures. We would, well, if he were here, we would attach ourselves to him, wouldn't we? Yeah, but he'd still yeah. say study the scriptures because he did that after he came back on, yeah. on uh, after resurrection uh, day. Yeah, sure. And since we don't have him here, the scriptures is the only choice we have. He doesn't want people to be overwhelmed by somebody's presence. That's why he keeps himself in the background. He works quietly. Which brings up our next question. In biblical times, in the times of Jesus now, let's think, just, just imagine ourselves back there with him a couple thousand years ago. What was, their re, what was their regard for Scripture? How did they feel about Scripture? The Old Testament in those days. That was the authority. That was the ultimate authority. Now, people interpreted it differently, and people were confused because of the different interpretations. But if you could produce a, a solid scripture, an answer to a question, that was it, right? Is it like that today? No, not today. Not today. So what are we going to do about that problem? Well, I don't, I think, I don't think it was very effective against the Romans either. Mm -hmm. no. Or the the secular, you know, communities of of the world, but but surely among the Jews it yes. was yeah. absolutely right. So now drop down to verse sixteen in the same chapter, Luke four verse sixteen. Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Okay, here's the young man come home. The homecoming hero, he said, they said, come to the front, give us a talk for Sabbath. Okay, fine. So he stands up. Now, how many people in the congregation knew him? Probably a fair Probably percentage. Everyone. Probably everyone. Okay, so they hand him the scriptures. He reads from Isaiah. What does he read? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free their press, to, and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Now, you recognize that that's a, a er, part of that passage is taken from Isaiah, well, all of it really is Isaiah 6. And how was that generally understood? What, what did they believe it was applying to? Uh, the Messiah. Messiah. It was, it was a messianic. They all thought, okay, this is a messianic text, right? And so when Jesus said, well, look what he said. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Now, that was the normal thing. You stood up to read the scripture. You twist the scroll, and you go or this way or that way until you find your place. You read it, and when you're done, you carefully roll it back. You hand it up to the attendant who puts it away in its safe place. And you sit down, and the rest of your sermon is given sitting down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him as he said to them, This passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. What was he saying? That he was the Messiah. That he was the Messiah. And they were very happy about that, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> and he was the one that had inspired the prophets before he became yep. an, a, a human. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they be happy about that? Well, that's my question. And after all those years of waiting, you would think, oh, well, finally he's here. Exactly. But we know was, who this guy is. Yeah. He's we not knew, the Messiah. We know where he grew up. We knew him as a little kid. He, yeah. he doesn't fit our preconceived paradigm. He doesn't yeah, fit. Anything good come out of Nazareth? Was one of the questions? Well, I don't think. Do you think the people from Nazareth would have said that? Possibly not. But, uh, <laughs> I, those that lived there, I'm sure, right. had some idea. Yeah. They might have had that. They may, they may have had that self-image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, I think that's Isaiah 61, not six. Well, that was interesting. I thought it was 61 as well, but what uh, is my I think, text? I think your reference is 61, uh, 1 and 2. is wrong there. That's, that's in my Bible. I have to call them up uh, and tell them to fix it if that's... It is 61. <laughs> it is 61. I yeah. thought so. I thought, hmm, sorry. Um, I have a wrong reference in the footnotes in my Bible, in my electronic Bible. So thank you for that correction, Gordon. A scribal error. It's a good thing we caught it. Who knows... Yeah. How many people would be yes. confused with that for the next several thousand years? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is part of a, of a whole collection of texts that if you wanted to search through the, the Gospels, you would find many of them that proves that Jesus was very familiar with the Old Testament. 
Now, did Jesus learn the, the Torah from uh, the rabbinic schools, and then he learned the, old, the rest of the Old Testament from the rabbinic schools, and then he learned all the favorite sayings of the prophet, I mean of the forefathers, so he could be a, a, an official rabbi? Well, did he attend those schools up until he was about 10? That's my question. <coughs> if everyone did it, I would suspect he did, but yet uh, Ellen White suggests that he learned at his mother's knee. It's, and it says in several places regarding him and regarding his disciples, how could they be learned because they didn't attend our schools? Well, maybe that was our advanced schools, our colleges. Well, yeah, that's also possible. He learned it from his mother's knee? Yeah. At, at his mother's knee. At his mother's knee. Yeah. That implies that she went to those schools, that she understood all his stuff. And right. that's, a, but that's a big question. However, there are hints also suggesting that she came from a priestly family, possibly. Now, I, you know, I don't, we, that, those are just hints. Be, and, and so people will say, well, you know, maybe she was a, I mean, why would God pick her? Obviously, there was something unusual about her. Now, I, I got a different take when I read that. I thought, I thought kind of in the age of the cradle roll up to Sabbath school for children, that's where she kind of shined. Okay. And then after that, who knows where he got all the information. He used to go out and pray a lot yeah. and study the scriptures probably by himself. But where would he have those scriptures? It would almost have to be from someone who had memorized them already or from the rabbinical school or from the synagogue school. Well, I thought you can go to the synagogue and get and Can't check them ways. out. Well, I know, but um, there is, don't they have access to them? Well, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, who has access? Any kid on the street? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very legitimate question. I, I've asked myself that question many times. Was, or, or, or was, was he able to go with his mother or his father maybe and, and access the, the scrolls? We don't know. Maybe there was someone constantly reading them and you could go in and for sessions and he, mem he was good at memorizing. Well, I mean, we already read that, that this was a standard pattern for, for male children. Mm -hmm. So well, maybe... <clears throat> maybe our understanding of how the scrolls were so restricted, maybe that's, maybe that's not quite true. Maybe, maybe those materials were more readily available than what we think. Well, you see, part of the problem would be, let's not forget this detail, detail, excuse me, their language was Aramaic following the Babylonian captivity. This, the, the scrolls, the Hebrew scrolls, I mean, the, the biblical scrolls were written in Hebrew. So you, okay. you, have, you have to start off by learning another language. Now, Hebrew and Aramaic aren't that far apart. They're a little bit like mm -hmm. Spanish and Portuguese. I mean, they're mm -hmm. closely related, but nevertheless, they're another language. So are, you, are you saying Jesus spoke Aramaic and not Hebrew? At home, yes. So he would have had to learn Hebrew. Well, there was a time... And of course, and I just, let me just add another point you wonder, okay, why was Joseph, why did Joseph establish himself in Nazareth if it was known as a bad place? Well, probably because two miles away was this huge new city being built by the Romans called Sephorus. And he probably got a lot of work working for them, which means over there he would have to speak what? Roman. Either, either Latin or Greek, or probably both. So it's very likely Jesus was good in four languages. Pretty remarkable, huh? Especially when you, you know, what do you, how, what do you call somebody who speaks three languages? Trilingual. Trilingual. What do you call somebody who speaks two languages? Trilingual. What do you call somebody who calls speaks one language? Us. American. An American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus walked with those two lesser-known disciples to Emmaus. Now that's the story in Luke 24. He opened to them the truth about himself from the Old Testament, beginning from Genesis. Don't you wish you had a recording or a transcript of that conversation? Oh, yes. What passages of Scripture did he access? What, what did he use? Now I'll, I'll, I'll let all of you, including you and the audience out there, uh, think about that one. 
I suspect that he, I suspect that the sermons that the apostles gave in, that we have recorded in the book of Acts and other places uh, reflected a bunch of the texts that yep. Jesus used on that road to Emmaus. Very likely. They learned and they used. Mm -hmm. And what was the, what was the general theme of those sermons? Do you remember? Here's what the Old Testament says. Here's what we find in the life of Jesus. Notice how he's a fulfillment of Scripture. This is what you ought to do. Go for it. And that's, you know, that's basically the theme of almost all the New Testament sermons. Yeah. So they clearly recognized the main theme of our lesson for this time, that Scripture is absolutely authoritative. Well, the lesson points out something that we need to think about, and that's that every one of us worships something, at least one thing. What do we mean when we say worship something? We'll devote uh, a great deal of our attention and time toward that. We consider it of great worth. Worthship is worship. That's where that term, that's where that name came from. So the thing that we think is most important in our lives is what we are worshiping. <coughs> now, we're not bowing down necessarily and doing obeisance or something like that, but that's what's important to us. So if I have a 60-hour work week, that's my worship? I take the fifth. <laughs> 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 well, nowadays, you could point to bank accounts. Yeah, 401ks or things like bank that. Bank accounts that people are think are very important. Mm -hmm. Well, and other people think it's uh, their house, and some people think it's their car, and some people say it's their social status. Some people think it's their job. But there are some people who think it's their God. And a number of other possibilities. God challenges us to make Him the most valuable thing in our lives, and therefore to worship Him. If we experience that kind of relationship with Him, the experience called faith, because faith is a description of what? A relationship. Our relationship with God, yeah. Uh, we will get to know Him better and better through Bible study, and as we do that, we will be changed. And of course, that's the famous passage from Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 555, By beholding, we become changed. However, Think about some of the different ways in which Christians have looked at Scripture. Can you think of a general approach that has been taken to Scripture? Uh, literal. Very literal. Um, <coughs> some people want to take it very literally. They regard, they would even regard the Bible as a kind of code book. Okay, here's what the Bible says. You can read it for yourself. Don't argue with me. That's what it says. And so that's what I need to do, right? That's reading the Bible as a kind of a code book. Can you think of another way the Bible is read? Well, symbolically, of course. Yeah, some people, and some people are so much into the symbolism business that they, they go one of two ways. They want, it, they want to allegorize everything. They want to find almost every story has, you know, this is, it stands for that, and it stands for this, and so forth, and you just wonder where they're going with all that. On the other hand, there's a lot of people who say, well, you know, these stories are just, you know, they shouldn't be taken too seriously. I mean, after all, they just represent good things in a Christian life and so forth and move on. And there's a lot of people who see the Bible just as a description of the fact that the plan of salvation, basically. How does God save you and me? That's all that really matters in theirs, how God saves you and me. But now, if we're going to be disciples, how do we need to read the Bible? That's a revelation of God. Yeah, absolutely. If, if we're going to learn something about God, that's the, place, that's the number one place we need to go. And if we've got to be the followers of God, disciples of God, that's what we need to know, right? Of course, where's... And, and, and people would say, well, you know, who has, who has any questions about that? We all, we all believe in God. We all trust in God, right? No questions about that? Well, not so fast, right? Remember that Lucifer, back in the Garden of Eden, called God a liar. 
That's, you can read that right there in Genesis 3, 1 to 5. Probably not the first time he did it, though. Probably not. In heaven, he somehow convinced a third of the angels to rebel against God. So we're now stuck with the most important question of all, all the way through Scripture, and a question that many people don't even ask, and that is, who is telling us the truth? Who is telling us the most important question in the Bible? Every story, what does it say about God? Who is telling us the truth? Well, there are many texts. Let's, let's just pick out a couple of them. Look at Matthew 5, 17 to 20. And Jesus, this is a part of what? The Sermon on the Mount, right? Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with. Not until the end of all things. So then whoever disobeys even the least important of the commandments, and Jay, here's a, an example of people who want to take the Bible very literally, the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, whoever obeys the law and teaches others to do the same will be great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you then that you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven only if you are more faithful than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in doing what God requires. And I'm sure there were some Pharisees and some Sadducees in that crowd. And How do you suppose they felt about that moment? Nobody could be better than I am. No way. Not possible, right? Well, if, if, if the regular congregation felt the same way, mm -hmm. then they may have felt, well, the priests and the rabbis, they're, they're paragons, so then there's no way I can be like them. And here are these guys that have the Bible memorized, right? I mean, how can I be better than those guys, right? I have to interpret it correctly. Well, look at another passage. In the, you know, there's several of them there, but look at this one from the, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Now, what do we find in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John? Jesus' prayer to his Father. The prayer, Jesus' prayer to the Father just before getting into the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, starting with verse 14, I gave them your message, this is Jesus talking to his Father, and the world hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I do not ask you, this is Jesus speaking to the Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not, do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth your word is truth. What did we say a little while ago is, was the main question of Scripture? Who's telling the truth? Who can be trusted? Who, who can, who's telling the truth? And what does Jesus say? Your word is truth. Your word is truth. I sent them into the world just as you sent me into the world, and for their sake I dedicate myself to you de in order that they too may be truly dedicated to you. And there's a lot of other passages that have similar import. What keeps all this stuff being more than just a claim. I mean, because you good question. Because you said, well, Jesus says he's the truth, therefore he is the truth. You know. And let me okay, isn't that just a claim? Or? Well, let me take the ultimate example of that. A um, couple of them, if you will. Um, in Second Timothy three sixteen, let's just look at that for a second. It's not in my lesson here, but let's just look at it. 2 Timothy 3, starting with verse 16. We probably need to go down through 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Now, when we say all Scripture, what does that include? Everything, but... You just said that these Pharisees had it all in their head. Okay, but be so, careful. Well, Why do we need I to be careful? I don't have to be careful because I'm just asking you. <laughs> just because something is in writing, which means scripture, doesn't mean it's profitable it, or that it's inspired well, by God. 
That's and yeah. there was there's a lot of other materials. Is there apocryphal books going around at that time? Okay. Is it apocryphal? So we as Adventists often have opened our Bibles to Second Corinthians C sixteen, and this is proof. You see, you should believe everything that's in this Bible. But if you happen to be holding a Catholic Bible, as the Catholics do, and they read this same text, and they have those 14 extra books, and they said, you see, our 14 extra books are inspired because all Scripture is inspired by God. Says, now what are you going to do? It says you should pray for, to the dead and a few other things that we yeah. don't subscribe to. Yes. <laughs> Some of the New Testament hadn't been written yet when that was written. A lot of the New Testament hadn't yeah. been written. Well, Second Timothy, not, not much of it hadn't been written. Most of it had been written by that time. But I can tell you that there are churches today who have extra materials that they regard as inspired or, or at least authoritative. And in those scriptures it says things like, if you just read this material and you study it long enough, you will realize that it is the truth. The Mormon Bible. Yeah. So what are we going to, how we deal with that kind of stuff? I suggest you read the footnote. Yeah. Or the, the other method of translating that, which says all scripture, all inspired scripture Every inspired scripture is profitable. That's the other way to read that yeah. passage. Yeah. So and that's, now we have to figure out what's inspired. That's right. That's Unfortunately, you have to do some thinking. <laughs> okay, okay, thinking, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what was, and, and let's be honest, in Paul's day, did he have neat little Bibles bound up and with nice leather covers that they could, he could hand one to Timothy and say, you know, here it is. No. Nope. What did he have? It's scrolls. How many scrolls? Lots of them. Lots of them. In fact, a lot of them that claim to be scripture that we would say today were not in scriptures. They haven't borne the test of time. So to Timothy, almost certainly what Paul was saying was not all scripture inspired by God, but every inspired scripture is profitable. Timothy, you know which ones those are because I've taught you which ones those are. All right. scripture inspired by God, not all scripture is inspired yeah. by God. And by the way, if you look at your King James Version, the little is is in italics. In italics, which means what? That it was added. It's not it's in the not Greek. It's not there. It's not there. You have to decide whether you want to put it in there or not. And it's convenient for proof text approach to scripture, so we like to have it in there. Some people do. Okay, now I've gotten a guide a person came up to me and he straightened me out. He knows, he knows what's inspired. Okay. Okay. Should I trust him? Well, it, if he says so, the the right thing to do would be say, well, why do you say so? Show me why you believe this is inspired, and look at it. And ultimately, whether you like it or not, you have to make that decision for yourself. Now, your decision may be to trust somebody else if you think they're reliable. Or eventually, you're going to have to say for yourself, okay, I'm going to look at these books myself, and I'm going to decide whether or not they're reliable. Okay. Those are the two choices you have. And t testing, testing, trusting someone else can be pretty risky sometimes. Okay. In our day, however, we have another problem. So many people have lost their confidence in Scripture or never had it to begin with, and have come to regard the scriptures as nothing more than myth or a book of good moral principles by which one may choose to live his life. One illustration of this was found on a huge billboard posted in Times Square in New York City during the Christmas season in 2012. It pictured Santa Claus right beside Jesus and underneath it said, keep the Mary, dump the myth. And guess which part they regarded as myth? This most recent season, in 2013, one Christian group has responded by posting a large billboard, also in Times Square, which says, to our atheist friends, thank God you're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that I, argument didn't really get anybody anywhere. Well, but it, yeah, <laughs> it was just about as reliable as the one that the atheist put up. <laughs> Once again, the question should be, how do we know who's telling us the truth, right? Isn't that ultimately the question? So, have you ever discussed with a, a Christian of another denomination, another faith, uh, how he feels about, say, the six-day creation, the exodus, the virgin birth, 
the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. What are you looking for if you ask from that? Well, I, I, I was going to ask the question first, and then... <laughs> how many people take... I'm really asking the question, how many people take the Bible seriously in 2013 or 2014? A remnant. I don't think you even have to look to other churches necessarily. You can look inside the Seventh-day Adventist Church mm -hmm. and have some no's to some of those questions. If you believe, for example, that the first... 11 chapters of Genesis are nothing but myth. And why, why would someone say those 11 chapters are nothing but myth? They think things just evolved. Yeah, but they, they feel comfortable in saying that primarily because there's no way you can go back to archaeology or anything else like that and positively prove any of those things. Right. They're pre-flood or just immediately post-flood. You can't prove them. So, it's, it's sort of their word against your word. Okay. Well, Jesus came along very early in his career and preached a, at least one sermon, and it may have been several sermons that were later put together by Matthew, and Matthew 5 uh, through 7. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And um, what does that teach us? We've already read about three verses from that uh, that passage, but he goes on then, starting with verse 20, 21, he says, you have heard that people were told in the past, so forth and so forth, but now I tell you, and he goes on, you have heard, but now I say, you have heard, but now I say. And I'd like to stop for a moment and say, well, where did those you have heards come from? Scripture. <clears throat> what part of Scripture? The Old Testament. Some of it came from the Old Testament, but some of it was interpretation, their interpretation of the Old Testament. Yeah, most of it came from the Old Testament, pretty fairly straightforward interpretation of the Old Testament. And who inspired the Old Testament? Holy Spirit and God. Is Jesus opposing the Holy Spirit now in this sermon? Well, you can look at it as taking the next step. It's not really opposing, do What's you? What's he doing? taking the next step. What do you mean by that? Well, um, there's probably, when you teach somebody, you, you teach them um, up to a point that they understand, and then when they've digested it for a while, and they kind of understand more of what it is, well then you take them to the next place. Jesus was saying, if you want to really know what the scripture, how the scriptures are to be applied, they need to be applied to your thinking. They need to apply to what we sometimes call heart religion and not just outward behavior, right? What did Paul say about that? Remember in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, uh, no, I'm sorry, Romans 7? Do you remember what Paul says there? Hmm. Sorry, I'm expecting you to jump around here a little bit. <laughs> Romans 7. Paul had some problems with doing everything he thought he was supposed to, and what did he do about it? He said, the things I want to do, I can't do, the things which I know are right, I just, I just can't manage. And what was his response to all that? Do you remember? Thank God for Jesus. <laughs> what? Thank God for Jesus. Yeah, thank God for Jesus. And that's basically what he says. He goes to chapter 8, and he says, thank God, and then he goes on to explain the fact that all three members of the Godhead are on our side. That, that ought to be a thank God experience, right? So, exactly wh what is that saying? That God is on your side. How does that, how is well, that um, better than actually doing things right? Okay. Uh, obviously, if you could, if you could do everything right, that would be fine. We know that we, we none of us is ever going to reach that standard to always do everything right. Uh, it's important to recognize all three members of the Godhead are on our side, because many of our Christian friends think that the judge, the harsh judge, is the Father, and Jesus has to constantly plead with the Father to accept us, not to be too harsh. Da da da. So they do not see all three members of the Godhead as being on our side. Many of our Christian friends see it that way. Well, look at these words from Ellen White. 
has something strange and new. These words, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, fall upon the ears of the wondering multitude. Such teaching is contrary to all they have ever heard from priest or rabbi. Contrary? People who are supposed to have memorized the Old Testament? They see in it nothing to flatter their pride or to feed their ambitious hopes. What would be the pride and ambitious hopes about? Ambitious hopes that to overthrow the Romans. Yeah. They were going to rule the world. They were going to overthrow the Romans. They are going to rule the world. But there is about this new teacher a power that holds them spellbound. The sweetness of divine love flows from his very presence as a fragrance from a flower. His words fall like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth, Psalm 72, 6. All feel instinctively that here is one who reads the secrets of the soul, yet who comes near to them with tender compassion. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 6. So, what should be our approach to Scripture in our day? <coughs> Do we sound more like Pharisees and Sadducees or more like Jesus? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why are you Some, chuckling under no, your breath there? Because sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Okay. Now, when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of things that were radically new in it. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that's one of the reasons why they were spellbound, because these are new ways of looking at things that maybe they haven't tried before yes or even seen it happen before and even theoretically th even theoretically it it might work but um, you know mm -hmm. so if anybody was brave enough to actually try this out <laughs> maybe that would maybe that would prove him to be true you mean the revolutionary idea that we ought to really try out Christianity what you're talking about? Well, I'll try out some of these concepts that he's <laughs> bringing up for the first time, yeah. because I I don't think anybody's ever heard that before. Of course, we we have it in our Bible and we ponder it all the time, but but that must have been something. Mm -hmm. Many, sorry, Go ahead. many other things when Jesus said you you were told this, but do that, he also tell them why. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when he said you were told not to divorce but because you are so such and such you know he you know there were reasons so a lot of the things he told to say were applicable to their lives or the way they live and mm -hmm. yeah mm. The, the books of Moses at least the second through fifth were given to slaves that had mm -hmm. just come out of being tormented and they hadn't been able to think for themselves so they may have been given the very basics. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus in the New Testament is explaining okay. what his real desires were. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was, this was a sermon presumably given to thousands of people. What about Jesus' talks with individuals? Think of Nicodemus and Mary and the Samaritan woman, remember? And Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler. What do these stories tell us about his mission to earth and discipleship? Can you, I mean, just pick out one or two things that might, that you might want to mention? Well, the individual sermons to the mm -hmm. individual person actually is fitted for that person. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty incredible, too, because um, how many sermons can you come up with for, like, this person or that person yeah. that help them answer their questions? And it seems like you need to know them, you know, at the beginning yeah. to be able to put together something to talk to them. Know, to, your know your audience. Yeah, to be able to, to read the individual need of this person who has just shown up here. Maybe you've never even met them before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, maybe there's a lot of general things that people do over and over again that you <laughs> run into a lot. And you might just pick that out. Look at, look at the words from, me, from Jesus in the upper room. This is the night before he's crucified. I'm not talking about all of you. Now, why would he say that? He knows that there's a betrayer in the crowd, right? Wait, where, where are you reading from? I'm reading from John 13, starting with verse 18. Okay. 
I am not talking about all of you. I know those I have chosen. But the scripture must come true that says, the man who shared my food turned against me. I tell you this now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. How, are, how do we know the scripture is reliable? It's predicted, and then it happens. I am telling you the truth, whoever receives anyone I send receives me also, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Okay? So, what, what is the purpose of prophecy in that case? So the one, the, when the action or the, the event comes to fruition that you can look back and says, hey, this was foretold. So that the person that foretold that must know something. Yeah. Exactly. Like, is he dependable, reliable? Uh, and you can go through the, through the Old Testament, you can say, God said this, look what happened. God said this, look what happened. God said this. And you, after a while, you say, this guy must know the future, right? Well, not only that, but if he hadn't have said anything, we could have came up with a different conclusion that somebody snuck up on him. Yeah. And what he's doing there is making it clear that nobody sneaks up on him. He, ha he knows everything. He knows everything that's going to happen. And I'm choosing to go through what this is yep. going to do to me. Okay, again from Mellon White. Beginning at Moses, the very alpha of Bible history, Christ, and this is talking about his discussion with the two men on the road to Maus, Christ expounded in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Had he first made himself known to them, now think about how we would respond, had he first made himself known to them, their hearts would have been satisfied, and the fullness of their joy, they would have hungered for nothing more. And what would they have done, do you think? They just would stop. Turned around and raced back to Jerusalem, right? But it was necessary for them to understand the witness borne to him by the types and prophecies of the Old Testament. So God is saying, it's time for a little careful evaluation, right? Upon these, their faith must be established. Not just because they knew Christ personally, but what? Because the positive proof was there in the Old Testament, right? Um, Christ performed no miracle to convince them, but it was his first work to explain the scriptures. They had looked upon his death as a destruction of all their hopes. Now he showed from the prophets that this was the very strongest evidence for their faith. And teaching these disciples, Jesus showed the importance of the Old Testament as a witness to his mission. Desire of Ages 796, and then another part of it's over in 799. So now, here's the question. Do you remember hearing a Sabbath school class, a sermon that made your heart burn in you? Maybe you better not answer that question. And what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean, yeah. I, it almost sounds like something you got to go through to understand it. Well, I can tell you this. Um, now you're going to, I'm going to have to tell you my personal secrets here. I have a small little MP3 player that I carry in my hand and I listen to material while I run. And I don't listen to songs and other things like that. I listen to scripture, I listen to the writings of Ellen White, I listen to sermons and so forth like this. And I can tell you on a number of occasions, especially when listening to Ellen White, I find myself saying, yes, I'm out there running, you know, down the track, and yes, I get all excited because I see something that is it's a new res revelation for me. And I think that's probably something like what these, you know, these guys were probably just jumping inside. You know, they, yeah, look at that, look at that, look at that. Yeah, look, that's true, isn't it? I can just see them, hear them making that kind of comment. Well, why did the religious authorities, the so-called experts on Scripture, take such an opposing attitude toward the teachings of Jesus? I mean, we don't, I don't even need to read that to you all know that. It was contrary to, well, to what they had come to, to believe and to promote as an appropriate and proper interpretation of the Scriptures. Yeah. Which made them look after all of this fantastic training that you described that they had received, um, 
like they didn't know what they were talking about. Also, it was a, it was a threat to their to their position in the community, their, and, and their national ambitions. Yeah. Well, look at an example. Matthew 12. This is also in other places in Mark and Luke. When Jesus heard about the plot against him, he went away from that place, and large crowds followed him. He healed all those who were ill, gave them orders not to tell others about him. He did this so as to make true what God had said through the prophet Isaiah come true. And I, I actually should have backed up a little bit. What, what happened? He went to the synagogue on Sabbath, synagogue in Capernaum, and in came a man with a crippled hand. And of course, what do you, you know, you could see the people there, and they're, hmm. Because who was in the room? Scribes and Pharisees. Who else is in the room? Jesus. Who is making the present presentation up front? Jesus. And What's going to happen it, here? And it may have been very obvious that this man had come for something other than the sermon. To sit there and listen. Yes. And what did Jesus say? <coughs> he asked a question, didn't he? Yeah. He asked a question. Here it is. What if one of your... Well, back up. Um, is it against the law to heal on the Sabbath? And what was their response? They all kept quiet. Nobody said a word. <laughs> because, I mean, I mean, the answer should be obvious, right? I mean, do you want to do good on the Sabbath or bad on the Sabbath? Do you want to help people or hurt them? I mean, you know. So everybody's completely silent. And because why were they silent? Because they knew the Pharisees were sitting there, right? I mean, let's be honest. We, we can imagine this, can't we? And they knew what Jesus could do, right? They had seen him perform a lot of miracles. And so what does Jesus say? Come up to the front, let me touch you, let me make you well. No, what did he say to the man? Stretch out your hand. Is there anything wrong with saying stretch out your hand? Except that your hand, only if your hand doesn't stretch out, right? <laughs> Yeah. I like John 12, yeah. 42, 44. It said, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, yeah. for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's and sad. If you go over to, to Acts 15, verse 5, it'll say that many Pharisees eventually became Christians. Okay. They still had some of their Pharisaical ideas, but they had become Christians. Okay, well, we need to keep moving here. So, what was their response? They wanted to kill him for performing a good deed on the Sabbath. So, what is Jesus' response? He left the area. Good. I mean, what else can you do? Well, he pulled a big contradiction. Because, first of all, okay, he's kind of working on the Sabbath, but yet he's using power from God on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So... That kind of messes up their thinking, and uh, <laughs> he didn't. They didn't want to undo everything. They have to rebuild it again. Mm -hmm. After that, it'd be just better to get rid of the guy. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, we've suggested already. And our time is running out here. That Jesus regarded the scriptures as being totally reliable. So, and, and if you read places like Mark 1, 1 to 3, and then go over to Acts 1, 16 to 20, and 3, 22 to 24, or even Romans 10, let's just look at Romans 10, 10 and 11, the time we have. For it is by our faith that we are put right with God, it is by our confession that we are saved. The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. So, apparently, it seems pretty clear that eventually not only did Jesus clearly believe in Scripture, but the disciples came, and, and Paul in this case, came to believe that the Scriptures are authoritative. Um, when the disciples came forth from Pentecost, you remember P Peter's sermon there, we are left with these words, Christ in his ministry, this is Alan White again, Christ in his ministry had opened the minds of his disciples to these prophecies. Peter, in preaching Christ, had produced his evidence from the Old Testament. 
Stephen have pursued the same course, and Paul also in his ministry appealed to the scriptures for telling the birth, sufferings, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. By, in, by the inspired testimony of Moses and the prophets, he clearly proved the identity of Jesus of Nazareth with the Messiah and showed that from the days of Adam it was the voice of Christ which had been speaking through patriarchs and prophets. From starting when? From the days of Adam, right? So, um, no doubt Jesus was a very charismatic person. But he doesn't expect people to believe him because he's charismatic, charismatic or that he, he's some kind of a fantastic speaker. He asks them to believe in him because he is fulfilling the predictions in the Old Testament about him. So what makes the Bible different from other books in the couple minutes we have left? Well, there's lots of things. It's a very truthful book. There's lots of stories in there that uh, don't paint uh, people in a very good light. Mm -hmm. And so we want, we, we want books that tell, don't paint people in a good light, is that? No, we just want books that tell the truth. Okay. Yeah, you not, what? Sorry, because it, it affects you differently. I've sat in my, my room and read a passage of the Bible, and you don't even understand why. You, you mentioned before about how it, your heart burns, and you may just start crying and feel, you know, you feel something that you will not going to get from reading Shakespeare or some other. It's mm -hmm. a different kind of feeling. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's a undescribable. Well, if we, see by, if we see God acting behind every story in the Bible, and we go to the Gospels and see what he does there and so forth, and realize what an incredible thing there is there, we might have favorite stories, favorite parables, favorite passages from Scripture. Think what those passages mean to you, and ask yourself, why do I pick those passages? What about the other passages here and then? Do I need to read more passages so that they can become favorite passages also? Do we, do we need to unthink some of our ideas? Are there, or do we have notions that are keeping us from understanding Scripture correctly? I certainly hope there aren't too many, but it's very likely there's a lot of things we need to relearn. And the way to relearn them is by studying the Bible carefully, thinking about what Jesus was doing, thinking about how he, re how he interacted with the people in his day, and then try to imagine how he would act if he were in your shoes in this year doing what you do. See you next week.